disturbing signs of the moral, cultural, and spiritual breakdown of America. That's the topic of today's Bold and Blunt, and I'm your host, Cheryl Chumley, giving you a Christian conservative look at today's news, politics, culture, and events. Did you catch that video coming out of Charlottesville, Virginia, the one where the little bitty, itty bitty kids were reading from an LGBTQ uh, approved talking point memo and celebrating Pride Month while parents parents and teachers and staff stood by and, oh, applauded. Isn't that so cute that Janie uh, talks about lesbians and, and gays and so forth? This is horrific. This is horrific. These were elementary school kids and they're slinging words out there like lesbian and gay and transgender. And they're talking about all those words in context of tolerance. You know, in order for them to say those words, and talk truthfully about tolerance, somebody's got to explain to them what those words mean. If they're talking about tolerance for lesbians, well, the logical extension there is somebody's got to tell them what lesbians are. And why would you talk to your fourth grade daughter or son about lesbians and homosexuals and transgenders? Their minds are still processing the latest Dr. Seuss green eggs and ham dilemma that they read. And now they're being thrust into this arena of blatant wickedness where they're supposed to process what lesbians are, what lesbians do. Crazy. We can't talk about God and the Bible in school, but we can certainly hold events where little kids talk about lesbians. If that's not a sign of the end times, spiritually speaking, I don't know what is. And before I get into all that, I want to quickly mention, if you like Bold and Blunt, you may get Bold and Blunt at edify.app, the online platform for your faith-based podcast at washingtontimes.com. Please, when you go to washingtontimes.com, scroll to the bottom of the page in the newsletter section, click on it, and find my newsletter, Cheryl Chumley, Bold and Blunt. It's titled that because I am. Click on that and please sign up for my three times a week newsletter. It gives you all the commentaries, all the talking points, all all the latest news about the far left loons in America and equips you with the info you need to fight these far leftist loons. And guess what? Also contains my Tuesday and Thursday Bold and Blunt podcast. All in one, one fell swoop, as the saying goes, you can get all my stuff delivered right to your email box. You may also get Bold and Blunt at Real Life Network. That is the platform of Pastor Jack Hibbs out in California. I am proud to say that my Bold and Blunt is now part of his wonderful lineup of videos and podcasts that he offers, uh, all from, again, a faith-based perspective. Perspective. And guess what? You can get Bold and Blunt wherever podcasts are offered. No need to dig deep and, and do deep dive searches. Just go to Spotify, Apple, wherever and get Bold and Blunt there. I want to play you this video. It's from YouTube. It is something like 52 seconds and it's under the headline, Leaked Video Shows Elementary Students LGBT Propaganda. But I want, I want to play you this, and then I want to play you a second video and see if you can tell the difference. Here we go. A is for acceptance. When you accept yourself and other people accept you for who you are. B is for belonging. When you know you are in the right place, surrounded by things you love and the people who make you feel good. C is for celebrate. Life is full of amazing moments and wonderful people. You should all celebrate each other. D is for different. No two people are the same. E is for equality. Almost done. F is for flag. There are lots of flags that F is for flag. Okay, if you didn't catch all that, okay, A for acceptance, B for belonging, C 
for celebrate, D for difference, E for equality, and F for flag. That was the entirety of the video posted on YouTube, which was then used by mainstream media outlets to describe these crazy conservative parents in the United States who decried what took place in Charlottesville, Virginia at an elementary school. Listen to this headline from CBS. Video of elementary school pride book reading goes viral. Conservative media and parents upset. And then the, the video that went with this headline, the video that was used to justify similar headlines, slamming conservatives for getting crazily upset about this school-based reading done by young kids in Charlottesville, Virginia. The video was largely the one that I just played, okay? Acceptance, belonging, celebrate, difference, equality, flag. These are all things that are very inoffensive. No conservative, no parent would generally raise an outcry if that was all that these students were saying at this school-sponsored Pride Month recognition event. Now, let me play you the full video, the part of the video that was conveniently ignored and dismissed by the media that took the partial video and ran with it to show not the horrors of what these little kids were saying at this Pride event, sponsored by the school, supported by the school, but to show how stupid conservatives were to get outraged over this pride event that was sponsored and supported by the school system. Here's the real video, the real reason for conservative upset. Sexual, trans, queer. Cool. Now, let's have a book about Pride Month. Did you catch that? Did you catch what that sweet little girl was saying? Uh, well, well, it stands for lesbian. It stands gay, for lesbian. Bisexual, trans, gay, bisexual, trans. This is a little fourth grader girl speaking before an audience of like-aged boys and girls with their parents in the background, with the school administrators in the background. And the school, when called on this outrage, said, well, we didn't sponsor this event. These little kids sponsored the event. Really? Really? A little fourth grader just decided to start reading LGBTQ promotional materials on a field after she gathered dozens of her classmates and seated them on the cement in front of her? Really? I remember a time not so long ago where students much older sponsored and participated in with their coach prayer sessions on the football field at public schools before games. And school officials cried about this as being an unlawful sponsoring of religion, of evangelizing, even though that was truly voluntary. It was not an event, a prayer event started by the school. It was started by the coach and, and, and kids and it was completely voluntary. But boy, did schools fight that. Part of their argument then was that students participating weren't really participating in a voluntary manner, that they felt pressured to go along with the prayers that this coach kicked off in the field because of his position of authority. And yet, 
We're supposed to believe little elementary girls and boys, fourth graders, kicked off this pride event without any sort of backing or influencing or pressuring from school administrators and parents. Cool. Now, let's have a book about Pride Month. Cool. Now, let's have a book about Pride Month. From that... The freelance star in Fredericksburg, Virginia, writes this headline, Right-wing media circulating video of Charlottesville students at Pride event. As if, as if right-wingers are the only ones who are actually concerned about sexual grooming of young children. Look, the video is horrific. But the video that the mainstream media is using to showcase parents and conservative parents especially as the problem, as discriminatory against the LGBTQ agenda, it has been cut. The the horrible part has been taken out. The part where a little girl talks about lesbianism and so forth. And the stuff that nobody has a problem with has been left in, talking about acceptance and belonging and so forth. But that's how the mainstream media just furthers a wicked, evil agenda that has been coursing through America for some time now. And it's getting to the point where we hear more and more, more and more talk about the end times, revelation, the the spiritual second coming of Christ and so forth. And I just wonder where you stand on that, where you think America and the world is when it comes to the end times. What are the signs of the end times? Life, hope, and truth writes, here's a checklist, religious deception, wars and rumors of war, famines, pestilences, or disease epidemics, earthquakes, signs in the heavens, persecution of the followers of Christ, lawlessness, and preaching of the gospel of the kingdom all around the world. Because it used to be very difficult to imagine that the gospel could be preached around the world before the internet came, right before technology, because it would mean that the Bibles would actually have to be physically carted and carried to those remote areas of the world, which were very difficult, if not impossible, to reach. Well, all that's changed now, so we can check mark that off the list of things that are almost impossible to see realizing and understand that, hey, the gospel is in fact being preached around the world rapidly as we speak. But here to me is a very interesting end time, right? Go to 2 Timothy uh, 3. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. How much more unholy can it get than having little fourth grade little girls read out loud about LGBTQ agendas in front of their classmates while parents, while staffers of the school, while administrators of the school applaud and dig down and defend. It doesn't get much more unholy than that unless you want to swing out to Calvary Presbyterian Church in, what is it, Los Angeles? No, San Francisco, California, Historic Presbyterian Church in San Francisco hosts All Ages Drag Queen Bible Story Hour. And get this, the church puts out on its Facebook page, For the gift of drag queens, oh God, we give you thanks. And it should be noted that once again, like every other drag queen event that goes on in America these days, it seems, children were welcome. We thank God for the great diversity present in this world, the church posted on its Facebook page, and hold to the truth that each and every one of us is created in God's image and loved by God. For the gift of drag queens, oh God, we give you thanks. So drag queens created in the image of God. 
unholy, unholy. I'm sure just off the top of your head, you can list another dozen or so end time checklist items that are either in the works of being done, conducted, finished, or have been done, conducted, finished. And if you're not spiritually minded in these perilous times right now, if you're thinking politics will save you, if you're thinking the right guy or lady in public office will change everything around and fix all that ails, I think you're wrong. I think you're mistaken. I think you're missing the mark. And I think you're part of the problem. But I have with me a guest today who is a noted journalist, broadcaster, podcast host. He actually pod, uh, hosts a great new podcast at the Washington Times uh, called Higher Ground. Uh, it, it's a video product. It's an audio product. And it has a companion newsletter called, guess what, Higher Ground. And it showcases all these goings on in the world through a faith-based perspective which is how we as humans should be viewing what goes on in the world anyhow. But he is a repeat guest on Bold and Blunt, and I admire his work greatly. Billy Hallowell, thank you so much for being on Bold and Blunt. It is great to have you here. Well, it's great to be here. You know, I love, I love this show. I love your work and always excited to talk about faith in our culture today. That is so kind of you to say, and I'm an admirer of your work as well, and I think this is going to be a great discussion. I'm sure when you look at what's taking place with the LGBTQ community right now, the pride flag being flung at the white, uh, flown at the White House in between American flags, uh, what's your response? What do you, what do you think of what's going on in America right now? Yeah, it's, it's really remarkable to watch where we are right now in that I think the biggest casualty of all of this is religious liberty, religious freedom, right? You know, we've had these conversations in this country for so long about respect and love for each person and that people are going to disagree. And, you know, a lot of these conversations have seemed well-meaning, but you look at where we are and you look at not just the imagery of what you just described, but the refusal to allow people to hold on to views and to express views that for thousands of years have been the mainstream view, right? This biblical view of, of love and of life. And you go down the line and what we're really watching right now is government and organizations attempt to sort of snuff out those traditional beliefs. And so that has been the most alarming part of all of this to me. It really went from, you know, we're going to respect and love everybody and give people a chance and, you know, to, to sort of live out their life the way they want to you have no right to express your view or the way you want to live your life out. And so that, you know, that's a very general sort of statement on it. But I do think watching that, that imagery from the White House and watching, and not just the imagery, but the, the comments from the president. I mean, yeah. you look at, at what Joe Biden has said about the, the transgender issue with kids, right? It, it, like, it's immoral if you won't transition children, essentially. And he's repeatedly said this. And so it's very disturbing to watch, honestly. And going back to what you just said about for thousands of years, there has been this sort of accepted norm of cultural behavior. And just astonishingly quickly, it's been broken here in America. And there are some smart people out there, and I'm sure you're aware of their uh, studies and, and analyses and so forth. But there are some very smart people out there who think that we are indeed living in what Christians would call end times. And uh, the rapture is imminent. Jesus' uh, second coming is right around the corner. What do, you, what do you say to that? You know, it's so interesting because I wrote a book on this. The first book I, I ever wrote um, a few years back was on this topic of the end times. And, you know, as a Christian and as, you know, a journalist and a commentator, it's sort of you know, just pulling information together after growing up in the church my whole life and hearing yeah, you know, the signs of the end times, it really is remarkable to see the times we're in because you look at Jesus' warnings, you look at the things that Scripture tells us, and a lot of people will look at those things, you know, earthquakes and rumors of wars and these different signs, and they will say, oh, 
you know, that's always happened. And to a degree, that that's true, right? I mean, there's nothing new under the sun. Scripture tells us that. But we can't know when the end is going to come. But we can know that there are some signs that point us toward, hey, we might be marching toward that a little faster than, than maybe we thought we were. And to me, the biggest thing that has me alarmed and paying attention you know, Jesus talks about people's love growing cold, right? And this obsession with the self that, you know, you sort of push God out and in place of God, you put the self. And again, that's not a new problem, but I think what we're watching from a 30,000 foot level right now, especially in the West, is people are pushing God out. They're putting themselves in the middle um, and there's a self-worship going on. And then you start to look at some of the other things You look at Israel, right? Israel being back on the map in 1948, that's a relatively new development, right? One generation, essentially, that Israel has been back on the map. And so there's a lot of debate in Christian circles about Israel and these other elements, but I do think there are a lot of things happening right now that point us toward that understanding that, hey, the stars are aligning on this, and whether it's another 2,000 years or 20 years or five minutes, it feels like we are much more primed for what we see being predicted in Scripture that will come to fruition. Yeah, because you look at all that and more, and you you, you look at how now the Bible is being interpreted in all these different languages. Because one of the one of the check marks that had to occur was that the Bible would be or the gospel would be preached throughout the entire world. And I remember years ago, pastors talking about, wow, we still have uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people who still haven't heard the good word yet. Well, that's changing with technology. Yes, yes. Well, also, you know, this whole thing with with AI, with artificial intelligence. Yes. <laughs> alarm, alarmed in a lot of ways. And you've seen these headlines, you know. I mean, what is going on? Right now there's a chat bot. Um, on Twitch, where it's it's this image of Jesus talking, people are putting questions in, and Jesus is responding. It's an AI bot. And, you know, you have people trying to rewrite the Bible at the same time. But to your point, just to focus on that for a second, because that is a major check mark, and there have been a lot of cultures that have been unreached, but with technology and with the rapid, you know, translation of Scripture, people are being reached, and, and really... Jesus is not going to return until everybody has had a chance to hear, you know, so I think we're, we're very close to that. We're inching closer to that every day. Uh, but then I also have these other concerns of, you know, these warnings that people are saying, oh, gosh, you know, Scripture is going to be rewritten. You're going to see new religions come about. And I, I do think, you, know, you look at Ephesians 6, the battle between good and evil, I feel like we're really watching that ramp up. And one of the things that I have found bizarre and, and alarming has been, you know, Satanism, right? You're seeing Satan, Satanism pop up in the headlines. You're seeing, it used to be that the devil loves to hide out, right? And so he would, he tries to hide out and trick people and sort of, you know, sneak, sneak into their hearts and minds. And that still goes on. But we're also seeing culture sort of embrace those satanic themes. And it's happening in entertainment. It's happening in all these different places. And so that's another interesting trend that I've been sort of looking at and trying to, to understand. Yeah, the, the Satanist clubs in, in schools and so forth. And then the absolute denial of this group's uh, members in saying that they even believe in Satan. It's funny, they adopt a title like the Satanist Temple or the Sa- Sa- Satanist Club, and then they say they don't even believe in Satan. Right, well, and that's the thing. And, you know, I've written on this extensively because people are very confused. A lot of people are saying, okay, well, these are Satanists who are worshiping Satan. Well, they're atheistic Satanists, right? These, the Satanic Temple and these other groups, they claim, as you said, not to believe. And yet you look at their events, and it's so bizarre. They're taking on the imagery, right, of Satan. They're using the imagery. And I think, you know, from a spiritual perspective, because we could talk politics and we could talk spiritual, you know, I think you can very easily be used by Satan without realizing you're being used and without even believing in him. And so... You know, it's fascinating to me that an entire group of people would worship, essentially, the literary idea of Satan without believing in him, and yet borrow from those themes. And, you know, at the end of the day, these are very progressive, atheistic political groups in some ways, right? I mean, that's what what they essentially are. And, um, you know, they they may have conviction in what they believe, but they're borrowing all those themes. And, 
And that isn't to say, because there are still people out there who do actually worship Satan, and that's a theistic Satanism, but the one that we typically hear about in the headlines is the quote-unquote atheistic one, and it's definitely a strange dynamic. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of the Democrat Socialists of America saying that they're not socialists. It's, you know, you can call yourself what you want, but you're still leading down the same pathway in the end. It may be slower than actual socialists, but it's still the same. That That's the same to me as the Satanic Temple and these other groups that deny they worship Satan. Oh, exactly. It, it is. And I think, again, you know, you've You've got a big political push. Let's remember, too, these groups, they're always advocating for abortion. They're always, If you look at what they're pushing for, it's, it's these sorts of, of values, right? They're, they line up exactly. In fact, there was a writer who was at that Satanist convention that got a lot of headlines saying, you know, gosh, this felt very much like a political, like a progressive political platform. They were just advocating for all of these things. And, you know, they have the right to do that, but I think people are alarmed, rightfully, and want to push back, especially, and let's let's remember, these after-school Satan clubs, why are they doing this, right? What is the point of this? It seems to me the point is to poke at Christians and others who, who have similar groups, and that has always been, you know, covering the atheist organizations over the years, and now the Satanist groups, my frustration as a human being has always been, well... What's the purpose of this, right? Is your purpose just to torment other people? Is it to tear down Judeo-Christian values? And I think there's a spiritual purpose for why they're doing that that they might not recognize. Um, but just, you know, as human beings, why are we going after each other in that way, right? Just kind of pulling back a little bit. So I've always That's always been a point of frustration for me, honestly. Did you see that video coming out of Charlottesville, Virginia, the, um, the elementary school there where they had little kids, fourth graders, talking about the LGBTQ Pride Month agenda, and the sweetest, littlest girls' voices talking about L stands for lesbian and, you know, being outspoken and actually stating that, and parents and adults just standing by and applauding. Did you see that video? I saw another one. I did not see that one, but I am not shocked. I mean, this this stuff is everywhere suddenly, right? I mean, it, it's an explosion. And why, why children? I yeah. mean, that is the part, and I know why, but why children? Why is this the focus, right? It's Again, you know, these are the same people, and I want to point this out, and you know this, I'm preaching to the choir here, but the same people who would not allow a football coach to pray on the 50-yard line for fear that people were going to be indoctrinated by voluntarily allowing these kids to pray. If they wanted to, they could walk up and pray with that coach. That had to go to the Supreme Court. We had to allow this man to fight for years for that basic right to pray on the 50-yard line, and yet we are putting kids in this position in many schools where they're reciting these things. It is just wild to me. Yeah, it it is. And Kirk Cameron trying to read uh, biblical stories in the same libraries that allow drag queen shows and so forth to go forward. And he has to fight for that access as well. It's disgusting now. Yeah. And, you know, and I think this goes back, though, to, you know, what I was saying at the beginning, right? Are we going to have a real conversation in this country about people's rights? Because this has been this has been a long-standing battle, right? And it seems like we're constantly fighting between the First Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment. Now, whose rights win out? Is it the religious people? Is it equal protection? And it seems like in some of these circumstances, and I'm stepping back from the Drag Queen Story Hour conversation and, and saying, okay, is there a middle ground? And what I mean by that is, in an ideal world, we could easily say, well, if you're going to allow this thing that we object to, right, this Drag Queen Story Hour, well, then you should be investing the same amount of time in allowing people like her camera to speak, right? The fact that that doesn't happen, I think, is pointing to this almost replacement of values that the country has just, like, ricocheted in this opposite direction. Um, and, and, you know, there are so many stories of ministries and organizations and individuals who are fighting to ensure that they have the basic First Amendment rights, including that football coach who thankfully did win his case last year. And and that is why when people say, oh, you know, you're complaining about all these things that, you know, a lot of the things we're talking about right now, five, ten years ago, we would have said, oh, that'll never happen. And a lot of the critics did say, that'll never happen. Well, now it's happening, right? And so you're understanding why people are waging these First Amendment fights. 
And let's ju let's just finish with this last question about what you just mentioned, the replacement of values in America. Does that mean, in your view, that America is on a path of definite peril, that there's no turning back? And I know that Christians always talk about, well, if we confess our sins and pray, God will save us. But I see a lot of prayer groups uh, springing up, but I don't see too much talk about sin and the fight to do away with sin, to turn from sin. Well, and what you just said is so important, because I think a lot of Americans are 100% convinced, and even people who are Christians, that the battle is going to be won through politics and courts and all these other things. Those are important battles to fight, right? Because you want to maintain those rights. And thankfully, we have had justices and people at the court levels who have been willing to defend those rights. But the real battle is a spiritual battle. And I... You know, I'm very torn because I look at things like the, the Gallup survey that just came out showing that more Americans are socially conservative than at least since 2012, right? So you look at that and you say, wow, something – if I'm Joe Biden and I'm the Democrat, I'm in a panic looking at those numbers because there's no world in which this country should be – people should be self-identifying more as social conservatives. That makes no sense. But yet people are retracting from the political and the cultural chaos, I think. And it's eight percentage points, but that is notable in a one- to two-year period for that percentage of people to say they're social conservatives. But, but the broader point, I think, is that I don't know where we're going to end up. I do think we could very easily see a situation where things continue to denigrate and become culturally dangerous, while at the same time you have a revival going on, right? And so yeah. you have this weird dynamic where people are coming to faith in – I mean, we saw 4,100 people get baptized in California a few weeks back. Um, this incredible display, watching that happen, the biggest baptism, as far as we know, mass baptism in American history. So those things are going to happen, I think, at the same time. And that is, the, to me, the Ephesians 6 battle is sort of really unfolding in an even bigger and broader way right before us. So I don't know if that answers the question, but I, I do think... It's going to be interesting to watch. <laughs> and you do more than watch. You participate in the fight. And I want to quickly mention your, the new newsletter that you put out at the Washington Times, Higher Ground. Uh, do you have a new issue that you can promote real quick? Yeah, you know, so that is out. And, you know, we also have the Higher Ground uh, podcast, which, you know, is has been a lot of fun. And you've come on that show, and you're going to, we're going to keep bringing you back on there to talk through the headlines and sort of focus on what the Times is covering uh, but yeah, there's, I mean, there's so there's just so much going on and loving getting a chance to talk about these things, uh, you know, just like you. I mean, you do such incredible work. Um, lo I love your commentary and really looking at the culture because we're not going to we're not going to win the war. We're not going to win the battle by fighting politics, but we should be engaged. We should be. I don't want I, I hate the whole let's just step out entirely and not have any position at all. Well, that doesn't make sense. But winning souls is the thing that is going to be what really changes hearts and changes minds and so that's that's where our focus is and you know love getting to do the news the newsletter and kind of pointing people back to the truth yeah i gotta agree with you on that winning souls is where the real war is well billy hallowell it's been such a treat to speak with you uh, i would love to have you come back on bold and blunt but i will see you down the line because we run in the same circles it seems absolutely thanks for having me thank you Interesting discussion, yes? I hope you mull it over, and if you're undecided about where to stand, spiritually speaking, faith-based speaking, you better choose soon, because believers out there, like myself, think time really is ticking away, and the longer you put off deciding whether or not to follow Jesus is the longer you are basically floating down the river doing Satan's bidding. Thank you for listening. I want to remind you, if you like Bold and Blunt, you may get Bold and Blunt at edify.app, the online platform for your faith-based podcast at washingtontimes.com, where you may also subscribe to my newsletter and get my commentaries as well as my Bold and Blunts delivered right to your email box. And you may get Bold and Blunt now also at Real Life Network. That is the 
platform run by Pastor Jack Hibbs out in California. And one more quick mention, you can just go to Google or Bing or a search engine and type in Bold and Blunt with Cheryl Chumley, and you can get my podcast wherever podcasts are offered. If you are a subscriber, thank you so much. Thank you very much for your support. And if you aren't, please check it out, subscribe, love to have you aboard. Thank you for listening. Tune in next time. And in the meanwhile, don't forget, stay blunt, stay bold.